This is Hiroshima. The date, August the 6th, 1945. A single superfortress, flying at 30,000 feet, approaches the town shortly after 8 a.m. Quarter past eight, 60,000 men, women and children had been killed. A further 100,000 had been injured. And almost the whole seaport had been destroyed by fire and blast. Those who survived were totally unprepared to fight the widespread fires caused by the heat flash. They were entirely incapable of dealing with the vast numbers rendered homeless or trapped by blast and they were wholly untrained to nurse and care for those injured and dying from heat flash burns or gamma radiation. So in an instant, a new era of warfare was born and a new and positive approach to civil defense became a vital necessity until such time as total nuclear disarmament provides the only real means of protecting the world against widespread destruction. Today, we live under the threat of nuclear weapons with a destructive power 1,000 times greater than those exploded at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, too, our scientists know much more about the effects of nuclear explosions. Accordingly, we have been able to plan effective countermeasures. We have devised precautions that can be taken by everyone to guard against the effects of a nuclear attack. Now, the day might come during a period of national emergency when you, the wardens, would be required to call on all householders personally and instruct them how to prepare their homes in the event of a nuclear attack. They would have had the Householder's Handbook, in which they're told to rely on you for further help and advice. It's up to you, to each one of us, to prepare for this very great responsibility. You would be their fountainhead of information, their instructor, their guide. You must not let them down. As part of this preparation, you have already been instructed in the effects of nuclear explosions. Heat flash, blast, and radiation. And you have probably, all of you, come to terms with it in your own minds. But to the public, the subject, especially radioactivity, would be entirely new. Remember, they would have to be taught to protect their families from something they can't see, can't smell, can't hear, and cannot easily understand. So, if the time should come, you will have to be prepared to receive all kinds of inquiries, doubts, and perhaps very strange ideas on the effects of nuclear explosions and on how they are to protect themselves from them. Individual inquiries that cannot all be covered in the Householder's Handbook, but on which the public will expect you to give them the answers the right answers. As an important step to meet this problem, we had a film made. A film to show you the sort of problems that you, the warden, might be faced with if you ever have to instruct and advise the public during a national emergency. Let's have a look at it, shall we?
Tension continues to mount in the world situation. Nevertheless, the government has just announced that negotiations are continuing. There were fresh reports today of an unidentified submarine shadowing units of the United States fleet at present carrying out maneuvers in the Far East. In the meantime, the precautionary measures ordered by the government yesterday are now being put into effect. The 3rd Parachute Brigade embarked this morning in RAF Transport Command aircraft to fly to an unspecified destination in the Middle East to carry out deployment exercises. Now here's an important announcement. The government has decided to call up all members of the Civil Defence Corps who will report to their headquarters. It's expected that wardens will start house-to-house -house briefing of the public tomorrow morning. Good morning, Mrs. Wells. Well, what is it? I'm your Civil Defence Warden. Is there any help or advice I can give you? Well, no, I'm sure. You've read the Householder's Handbook, haven't you? No. My husband says there's not going to be a war. All this panic's going to blow over. Anyway, I've got plenty to do without sitting around all day reading books. Thank you very much. Well, I'll call back when you've got more time, then. Good morning, Mrs. Jameson. Hello, Mr. White. I've been expecting you. Um, this handbook affair says I've got to give you details of everybody living here. Well, I've written them all down, but Aunt Nora, that's the one with arthritis ever so fall as she's been, she's only here Thursdays and Fridays, while her old man goes to Birmingham. He's in the garage business, you know. Do you want me to put her down as well? Because she's not here today, today being Tuesday, but come Thursday, she catches the bus from Leicester. All right, all she... right, Mrs. Jamieson. I'll make a note of it. Oh. One extra, Thursdays and Fridays. Now, which room will you be using as a refuge? Well, I don't really know. My son, Sid, the one who works at the builders up the road, he says the room at the back would be best because of the wall to next door. But I think the parlour would be better. Could ever such a lovely view over the town. I'm afraid a view wouldn't be much protection against fallout, Mrs. Jemison. The windows would have to be blocked up anyway. Let's go in and have a look, shall we? All right. Go on and play outside, Jean, dear. I want to talk to Mr. White. Come on, Missy. Come on, come on. Oh, I think our son's quite right, Mrs. Jemison. This room has only the one external wall facing the side, offering the more shielding from other buildings. You have the two party walls with their neighbours, which gives very good protection against fallout. Now, do you know how to set about blocking up your windows? Um, yes, I think so. Well, if you or rather your husband uh, want any help, come round to my place. You know, number 7 Wallace Avenue, the house on the corner of Station Road. You see how we did it. And if you have any special queries, Mr. Bellinger's your street leader. Do you know him? No, Bert Bellinger. Of course I do. He'll be around from time to time to see how you're getting on. Uh, by the way, do you know Mrs. Wells next door? Elsie? Yes, where about her? Well, I found her a bit difficult about this do-it-yourself protection business. I wondered if you might have a word with her or show her what you're doing. That's her husband, Mr. White. He's a rum and no mistake. I'll talk to her, don't you worry. Oh, good. That's the kettle. What about a cup of tea, Mr. Wine? No, oh, thanks. Now, is there anything else you want to know about? Yes. About the four-minute warning we're supposed to get before the attack. What in heaven's name can we do in only four minutes? Oh, a great deal. Above all, you mustn't be caught in the open. If you can just manage to take cover during those four minutes, Mrs. Jemison, you and your family will at least stand a better chance of escaping the worst effects of the explosion. Here we are, then. Oh, thanks. And don't forget, if we are attacked, you'll possibly get more than that four minutes. Now, that's the minimum warning which is expected. Now, is there anything else? Yes. Let me see now. Oh. Yes. Um, this fallout dust the book tells us about, what will it look like? You won't see any fallout dust, Mrs. Jameson, if you've taken cover as soon as the fallout warning goes. 
And once you've taken cover, the important thing is to remain there, whatever you do, until you're told that it's safe to come out again. Oh, I see. Thanks ever so, Mr. White. I'll tell my husband to come round and see your place. In fact, I may come too. Do that. And don't hesitate to ask me or Bert Bellinger if you want any advice. I'll better be off now. to me very carefully. You know all this war trouble has been in the papers. Now, tell me, strictly off the record, these uh, precautions you're asking us to take, will they really help us if we're attacked? Well, everything we recommend you to do is based upon the latest information from our scientists. And in fact, most precautions are pure common sense and should be carried out as a matter of course. Uh, for instance, uh, if you increase the protection already given by this school, it could be most useful as a communal refuge after an attack. We're asking all the schools and big stores and factories to do the same thing. I see. All right. Don't you worry, Mr. White. I'll start on it straight away. We mustn't forget the children. It's our duty to do it for them. My husband says he could put out any fire with this, Mr. White. Maybe, Mrs. Richards, I dare say he could, if there was any water running from the tap. But if the water mains were broken, which they very likely would be if you're in the damaged area, then there wouldn't be any water. And your excellent holes would be useless. Oh, cooking the water is the best bet. And the stirrup pump. If you can get one. I know people laugh at the old stirrup pump. They think it's a funny way of fighting an H bomb. But remember, even the biggest fires start off as little ones, and the stirrup pump can put them out as easy as winking. The whole house catches fire, Mr. White. It seems the heat from the explosion. Ah, the bricks and mortars don't burn, Mrs. Richards. But the heat flash can come through your window just like some light, setting fire to anything that will burn in its path. That's why we want you to whitewash the glass. In the same way as your husband does his greenhouse to keep out the heat of the sun. You may not believe it, but it does reflect quite a lot of the heat before it can get inside. Yes, I can understand that. Oh, it's cold standing out here. Let's go inside. Thanks. And as well as whitewashing, you should remove anything that'll burn, such as uh, Books, and papers, and cushions, and lampshades and such like, as far away from the windows as possible. Yes, I see. Oh, what about the curtains? We'll have to take them down. Oh, if you want to keep them up, dip them in a the flame-proof solution. They'll be all right. Good. I'll do that. Mr. White, I'm not at all sure that if this fallout stuff comes, we wouldn't be better off to load the car up. Henry says he'd be off in half an hour and just drive right out of it, go somewhere safe. Well, maybe, Mrs. Richards. But don't forget, you might be driving into it rather than away from it. And if everyone tried to push off into the blue, they might all end up in the most unholy traffic jam. Maybe still in the fallout area. No, it's much safer to stay put until you're told what to do. You're much better off undercover than in the open anyway. And one of us or the police will come round and tell you what's happening. But it's the only sensible thing to do. Because the roads must be kept clear for the civil defence services going into the damaged area. I suppose you're right. But how on earth we're all going to stay in one little room for days and nights on end? <laughs> we all end up in the madhouse. Better there than the mortuary, Mrs. Richards. Uh, I'd better be off. Anyhow, I'll drop in at our place and see how we've arranged our refuge room. It's quite comfy. It wasn't much of a problem, really. Thank you.
Hey, Mr. White. What I want to know is what you civil defense people are going to do about it. The shops are cleared right out of primers, stoves, battery radios and torches. Can't get them for love nor money. Your book says we ought to have them. Well, what are you going to do about it, eh? Book on the bus says these cases of fruit are all contaminated. Put for a secret ray before sending them over here. You see these purple spots, Mr. White? Joe Smith says it's radioactive. Will it hurt me? What about the children, Mr. White? Ought we to send them off to the country? Who's going to empty the dustbins? We should be up to our necks in rubbish. What about the banks, Mr. White? Is our money going to be safe? This fallout dust, if it gets on me, will it hurt me? Look here, Mr. White. I've done what the handbook said. Took me four flaming days. Now look at the blooming thing. Got two feet of water in it. Just where the heck do you expect me to dig my slip trench now? You see? Now, those scenes aren't exaggerated. The public will be told that you will be in charge, so you must be ready for it if you're to help them keep calm. Now, you recall that Mr. White in the film invited householders to come and see the arrangements in his own home. This is an excellent idea. So you must be sure that your own refuge room conforms to all the requirements laid down in the handbook within the limits of your purse. Now, let's have another look at the film and See how Mr. White has gone about making a refuge room for his own family. Well, this is it. Windows blocked up. Mattresses, plenty of blankets for each member of the family. Why don't you poke around and see things for yourselves? Oh, thanks. I must say it looks quite nice. But I've got a feeling we'd never get through our back door with all those sandbags. Couldn't we make do with boarding up the windows? Oh, yeah, that'll be all right. Hey, Dad! <coughs> Come over here. Paper plates and cups, that's a good one. I don't fancy them much. Aye, right, but it'll mean a bit more water for washing. What's in here? Oh, knives and forks and spoons. Pots and pans and tea towels. Oh, Dad, better remember to get another tin opener just in case. All right, all right. And make a note to check up on that promise of ours. You know, the one we bought for the camping holiday. Oh, we may need it. Well, that's the idea, Mrs. Jamison. <laughs> oh, dear. I hope you don't want us to buy a portable wireless set like yours, Mr. White. Uh, no need to bother with that. We'll get all the emergency broadcasts on our old main set, just the same as anybody else. Ah, uh -huh, that's true. If the power's on. But if it isn't, one of those portable radios is the best bet. And don't forget the spare batteries. And remember, too, if there is a power cut, you'll need a torch or candles and matches. Otherwise, you'll be sitting in the dark all the time. Oh, we've got those old paraffin lamps. We can use them. By gum, I can see you're going to do a bit of reading, Mr. White. Now, I think I'll stick to knitting myself. I tell you what, love. We'll get an old gramophone down from the attic. Oh, yes, we can play some of those old Gracie Fields and Henry Hall records. I expect Bill and Vera will bring some of that rock and roll stuff. Oh. Come along now. This is not our wife's choice. Now, here's something you must remember. You get a box, any box will do, and put all your personal papers there, medical cards and passports and so forth in it. Then you'll know that they're all safe in one place. Got it? Now then, food and water. This is most important. Fill all the jugs and bottles and buckets, anything that will hold water, including the bath, with at least a week's supply of drinking water. And cover them up, as we've done here. Well, what about tap water? Couldn't we drink that? Oh, no. After an attack, it'd only be safe to use it for general purposes, like washing up and cleaning, or fighting fires, if need be. Anyhow, you must never rely on water from the tap. I see. Well, we've no bath, but I expect we can find enough buckets and wash tubs to fill. Fine, fine. But uh, remember to keep one bucket back as an emergency toilet if you haven't actually got a lavatory in the house. That's most important. Dad, best remember to get a bottle of disinfectant. We'll be needing it. All right, dear. 
Now, Mr. Jameson. Food. That's your department. You better get in as much tin stuff as you can. There's all the stuff that we've got here. Uh, soup, tinned milk, and fruit and so on. Enough for a week or more. Baby food, Mr. White. Surely your M's never expecting a cake. No, no, no. It's for M's sister, Flo. She'll be bringing her youngest. Oh. <laughs> now, in addition, you better bring in fresh vegetables, fruit, bread, meat, you know, the sort of thing, and wrap them in polythene bags. Or store them in airtight containers if you've got them. And last but not least, the first aid box. Now, that's vital. Now make sure that you've got all the bits and pieces for controlling bleeding and treating shock and so on. That's all we ask. Well, that's the lot. Any queries? No, that's fine. Thanks a lot, Mr. White. And uh, now we've seen all that, we really can get on with it, can't we, Dad? Yes, we can. Oh, that's good. Well, don't hesitate to drop in if you have any more problems. Cheerio. Yeah. Good day, Mr. White, and thanks. Oh, hello, Mr. White. Might as well walk along with you. Just up to force me pools. Judging by this evening's papers, it won't do me much good even if I win treble chance. Tell me, Mr. White, how serious is it? Do you really think there'll be a war? Oh, personally, I think not. I don't think they risk it. But we've got to be prepared this time. We won't get another period of grace like we did last time. You remember the Thorny War of 39? We all got ready after war was declared and we were looking to get away with it. We won't get another chance like that. And another thing, the government wouldn't have called an emergency and got all you people locking up windows and making refuge rooms if there wasn't a real risk of a showdown, now would they? No, I don't suppose they would. No, this is serious. Make no mistake about that. Jameson to see you. Oh, hello. Nice to see you again. Well, good evening, Mr. White. How are you getting on? Well, since we were around the other evening, we got along fine. As good as finished, in fact. Oh, that's good. Uh, anything else we can help you over? Uh, yes. Uh, um, well, it's the dog, Betsy. Our little terrier, you know. We shall never be able to keep her and Tinks in the same room together for two minutes, let alone two days. Tinks? Oh, that's our cat. And another thing, we couldn't keep those two little terrors indoors forever now, could we? It is a bit tricky. Would we have to do it? Well, unfortunately, Mr. and Mrs. Jemison, it's a very important fact you'll have to face. You'll have to keep both of them in all the time. But could we take them with us if we had to move out? That'll depend entirely upon the transport situation, but I wouldn't count on it. More than likely, pets would have to be left behind if you were taken out by official transport. Of course, if you had your own car, that'd be different. I don't think I should like to go without them. Oh, that's fairly natural, Mrs. Jameson. But you must realise we'd only be taking you out if it was absolutely vital. In other words, you'd be running a hell of a risk if uh, you didn't. Oh, cheer up. It may never happen. That's right. That's what Elsie Wells next door keeps on saying. She and her will be out going to do a thing, Mr. White. I tried, I did try, really. But it's no use, no use at all. I've told her it's no good knocking on our door when the time comes. Well, thanks for telling me, Mrs. Jemison. I see I'll have to pay them another visit. Uh, don't you see, Mr. Wells? It's not right that you should endanger the lives of other people. If you don't take fire precautions, if any one householder in this street fails to take proper action, it could result in a whole row of houses being burnt down. Now, is that fair? 
And what about my civil defense chaps, Mr. Wells? You expect us to risk our lives with radioactivity? To rescue you and put you in somebody else's home? Somebody else has taken the trouble so that you can eat their rations and take up the space so badly needed by them? Now look here, Mr. White. We're not going to take any precautions. Why the heck should we spend a lot of money blocking up windows, buying tin food, portable radios and such like, when I'm quite sure we're never going to be attacked? Well, I hope you're right. But hoping is just not good enough. It's just not a case of us here in Nottingham being attacked. We can get the fallout from any other bomb or explosion in the country. None of us can be immune. None of us can be sure. So we all have to take precautions. Tell me, Mrs. Wells, have you got the first aid box in this house? You know, sticking plaster, bandages, that sort of thing. Yes. Why? Oh, Ted dear cuts his finger or something. I see. You think he's going to cut his finger? No. Well, you never know. Right, you never know. So you take precautions. That is all we're asking you to do, Mrs. Wells. Better to be prepared than to bleed to death. Now, can I send Bert Bellinger along to advise you on how best to make this house of yours safe? He's the street leader. He's the one who's most likely to be first on the spot if anything should happen. And what will you be doing, Mr. White? Me? I'll be in the post, receiving and sending out reports on what it's like round here, planning what to do and keeping you in the picture. Very nice, I'm sure. Very well organized, if I may say so, Mr. White. Very nice indeed. Now, come off it, Mr. Wells. How would the rescue teams and the ambulances know where to go? Yes, to save you and your damaged or burning house if the wardens weren't at their post, ready to meet and unable to brief them beforehand. Let's go now. Well now, Mr. and Mrs. Wells, don't forget, from now on, it's up to you. Good night. Thank you, Ray. Well, now you realize that a warden's life isn't necessarily a happy one. But once the public have learned to trust you, once they've realized that you and you alone are the men and women on whom they can rely for advice and assistance, that you really know what you're talking about, then they will trust you. They'll trust you implicitly. You must be firm, you must be patient, and you must know your facts. Then you'll have the respect of the people in your area. If you once lose that respect, and have lost their confidence, then you may have a very tough job getting it back. The public look to you to guide them. Indeed, they're advised and instructed to turn to you for help and advice. Don't let them down.